Arba'in, the 40th day after the death of Imam Hussein, millions of people all over the world fly to Iraq, land in Negev, and walk 80 kilometers towards his burial place in Karbala. This year I've decided to travel to my homeland, Iraq, to take part in the walk. This will be my very first time, I have never done this before, but the purpose is to learn what Imam Hussein stood for, to learn why millions of people come together and sacrifice their time and energy to either serve in the form of Mawakib or to walk from Najaf to Karbala to visit his burial place. So today is the first day on which we will be walking on the Arba'in March. I have some of my friends here who will be joining me on this walk. Karab, Amir and Abud. We <laughs> متوجهين إلى الإمام الحسين عليه السلام لإحياء شعيرة الأربعين مشيا على الأقدام من النجف الأشرف إلى كربلاء المقدسة نسأل الله أن يمكننا ونصل إلى الإمام الحسين ونحي هذه الشعيرة ونرفع رؤوسنا أمام الزهراء سلام الله عليها لأنه الحسين عزيز الزهراء And so the journey begins Najaf and Karbala is divided in roughly 1500 lampposts which are 50 meters apart these lampposts are numbered and act as a guide for the zuwar, or in other words, the visitors. Along the journey, I will share with you roughly which lampposts we have reached. Now, even though we set out at night, I found it so impressive that people are still out. It's incredibly wholesome to see people out, giving up their time to serve whoever passes at night. And so we carried on walking. I was in awe by the level of generosity, the positive energy in the atmosphere. Once we reached lamppost number 400, we decided to take a break. We thought it would be good to rest and have some sleep before we carried on. And so we found a mosque, a mosque with enough space to accommodate two to 300 people, duvets, pillows, and everything you need to have a good night's rest. AC was blasting, there were ports to charge your phone, bathrooms, as well as places to have a shower. And so once we woke up, I decided to go ahead and speak to the owner to the person who established this place. What went through his head to put together such a place? Why did they do it? Why did they sacrifice so much money, time and energy to do it? And so we said our goodbyes and carried on walking. The story of this man was extremely inspirational, but it was only the beginning. Wherever you go, wherever you turn, there are people doing the exact same thing to the capacity and the energy they can put out. By the way, we've um, reached pole number 497, so we're almost 500, so another two thirds. 
And so now I thought would be a good time to look deeper into why people are doing all of this. Why are people going all these lengths to serve those who are walking towards the burial place of Imam Hussein? Why are people putting out all of this energy and effort in the name of Imam Hussein? Imam Hussein was the grandson of the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. He grew up on the laps of the Prophet. He's also the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Prophet's cousin and the Prophet's daughter, Fatim. From the very beginning of Islam, the Prophet had many enemies. One of these enemies was Abu Sufyan, who opposed the Prophet up until the Prophet took over Mecca. Abu Sufyan and his son Muawiyah then joined the Prophet. Muawiyah became Prophet Muhammad's scribe. This was a typical characteristic of the Prophet. He would make use of the abilities of reading and writing and expertise of the people that would surrender in battle. He would never keep anyone locked up and he would never kill anyone or prosecute anyone. He would help them reintegrate into society. After the Prophet's death, Abu Bakr became the first Khalifa who appointed Muawiyah as the second in command in the conquest of Syria. The third Khalifa, Uthman, who was Muawiyah's cousin, then appointed him as the governor of Syria. After Uthman died, Imam Ali became the fourth Khalifa. Muawiyah blamed Imam Ali for Uthman's death and from this sparked the very first civil war within Islam. The civil war was then settled by peace negotiations. Eventually, when Imam Ali was assassinated, his successor and oldest son, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein's brother, took over. But he was challenged by Muawiyah once again. Because Imam Hassan did not want bloodshed, he pledged allegiance to Muawiyah on the condition that his son, Yazid, would not succeed him as caliph. And so they agreed, and for a long time, Imam Hassan, along with Imam Hussein, did not involve themselves politically with anything. This was up until the point where Imam Hassan was assassinated by poisoning. At the time, he refused to tell his brother Imam Hussein who had done this, to try and prolong the peace. But very shortly after Muawiyah's death, the very condition of the peace treaty that his son Yazid would not rise up to become the Khalifa was broken. Yazid set out to seek allegiance from everyone. Imam Hussein rejected his allegiance, along with the people of Kufa. Kufa was the place from which his father Imam Ali reigned as the fourth Khalifa. They were still very loyal to his father and they had heard about Muawiyah's peace treaty being broken. Now these rejections of allegiance could be argued to be solely political, but that wasn't the case. Imam Hassan, Imam Ali, Imam Hussein lived within the same household of the Holy Prophet. They saw how Islam was conducted and they saw that some of the leaders who were trying to take over Islam are not in line with the true conduct that they witnessed by the Prophet. Not gaining much support in Medina, Imam Hussein set off with his family and companions towards Kufa. Along the way, they were intercepted by Yazid's army in Karbala. After many back and forths and being denied access to water, they eventually battled and were slaughtered one by one. The women, the children and the ill were then taken to Damascus by foot. After people heard of Imam Hussein's death, they rose up, protested and eventually fought against the very Umayyad Caliphate who done this. And this is why, up until this day, many millions of people stand together to visit his burial place and stand together in his name. Thanks to his revolutionary sacrifice, he preserved Islam. He became a powerful symbol of hope for people to stand against tyranny and depression. For example, Mahatma Gandhi once said that he learned how to be victorious while being oppressed from Imam Hussein. Nelson Mandela once said, I have spent more than 20 years in prison. Then on one night, I decided to surrender by signing all the terms and conditions of the government. But suddenly I thought about Imam Hussein and Karbala movement. And Imam Hussein gave me the strength to stand for the right of freedom and liberation. And I did. And so in essence, the entire revolution of Imam Hussein isn't just religious. It's not just political. It's humanitarian. People within and outside of Islam take note of this and have learned how to stand against oppression, how to stand against tyranny, and people continue to do so today. So guys, we are officially in the city of Karbala and we are walking towards the shrine. So we have another half an hour walk until we arrive. And then many, how much people there? There is already, you know, on both sides of the road. 
So guys, we're almost here. We've just gone through what is called uh, essentially a saitara. It's um, a checkpoint where they check everything. You know, your belongings, you don't have any weapons. Um, you don't have anything that's dangerous that could pose any harm to anyone there. And this is one of the shrines, you know. It's right in front of us. Yeah. And the shrine works is there's two shrines. One of them is the Imam Hussein shrine, his burial place. And then the other one is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas shrine, which is Imam Hussein's half-brother. And they're buried next to each other, essentially. So this is all the people going out. And on the side, this is where you put all your shoes and belongings and stuff like that. So you can come and collect them afterwards. It's crazy. So well, this is uh, the exit actually, but hopefully you can enter through the exit, which is usually not allowed. Um, but you know, hopefully our connects come in clutch and let us uh, bring the camera in as well. Be nice to show you guys what it's like on the inside. So I was allowed my phone, but wasn't allowed my camera. But we're just entering. This is still the outside. Can you see these people walking in? Walking into the actual shop. Guys, the atmosphere here is absolutely incredible. There's some sort of peace about it. It's almost like as soon as people enter this door, they leave behind all of their negativity. And you can feel it in the air, you can feel it in the atmosphere, the level of energy. And everyone's coming, concentrating on one point. And that concentration, in a way, I don't know how to describe it, you can really feel it, you know? Everyone's so devoted, everyone's surrendered. And that wraps up my Arba'in experience of this year. It was absolutely surreal. It taught me many lessons. One of these lessons is that just because you are suffering, it does not mean that you cannot rise victoriously. Another lesson is that there's a complete different dimension of generosity that can be unlocked in everyone's hearts. Now, if you've enjoyed this journey, make sure you follow me on Instagram because there I have behind the scenes footage in the form of highlights. Furthermore, make sure you subscribe for more content like this. Thank you for watching and see you soon.